uh, as people filter in this morning uh, to Zoom and as we go live on Facebook, we are uh, delighted to see uh, people joining us uh, for our third week in our study of Mary in the New Testament and beyond. Uh, my name is Chris Holmes. I'm the scholar in residence at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Joined, uh, as always, uh, by Dr. Brennan Breed, who is an Old Testament professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. And this morning, uh, I have the great pleasure, we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Zainab Zailgen, who is a good friend of mine uh, from our time as postdoctoral fellows at the Louisville Institute, uh, which was a great two-year experience. Two years great. plus a little bit, because we did a... We we did a, a separate grant together, um, and uh, so we've we've uh, had great conversations about theological education um, and about other things in Louisville, often over really good food and uh, with. Really I know they feed us too too well. Too well, too well. <laughs> yeah, I, I always left it's feeling a little bit heavier than I went, uh, but oh, a yeah. lot more full. So that's mm -hmm. that's good. Um, well, so first of all, Zainab, thank you so much uh, for saying yes uh, to us and uh, our invitation to join us for Office Hours. It's a pleasure to see you and, and to learn from you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. We, we are too. So the way that we, we typically ask, uh, we, we typically have started Office Hours, uh, which, you know, spoiler alert, uh, you're the first non-Christian that we've had on this Bible study. So, uh, you know, th that's, we're, we're thrilled for this. So much pressure. <laughs> so much pressure. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, but we, but we generally ask all of our guests and I, and I thought it would be appropriate to ask you also as a, as a person who, who, um, uh, teaches and, and studies a sacred, a sacred text. Um, we ask about sort of theological or cultural assumptions that guide mm -hmm. the process of interpretation of scripture um, or of sacred texts. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, the, the question may even be a bad one, <laughs> you know, in the, in the conversation of interfaith dialogue, but we thought we'd still start there and see what, what you have in terms of uh, theological or cultural presuppositions. No, I think that's just an excellent question. Thank you for that. Uh, my theological convictions when it comes to uh, scripture are pretty mainstream Islam, uh, to put it out there. So it doesn't differ much from what uh, Muslims around the world think. Um, as a Muslim, I believe that the Quran, uh, which is Islam's central scripture, is the word of God. Uh, that means uh, that it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad through the Archangel Gabriel. Um, so it's really uh, scripture defines my, uh, informs my worldview, my attitudes, the way how I approach things. It informs my, you know, all aspects of my human life. Uh, but that doesn't mean when I say the very word of God, the eternal word of God, uh, it doesn't mean that we don't wrestle with scripture. Uh, so uh, it's really important to see always throughout Islamic history, as Muslims, we have wrestled with the revelation. So there is a marriage of reason and revelation. We really are, it's not a static text where we, okay, this is the word of God, everything has been said. No, but you see in the exegetical tradition that Muslims throughout have always wrestled, what does this word of God mean to me in this context? And how do I make sense of it? How do I apply it to our lives? And a testament to this is the commentary tradition, uh, a great, uh, you know, work that came out recently is the study Quran, which really features, you know, Sunni and Shia commentary. And you see that the history of the Quran was always a history of healthy dialogue and disagreement. So whatever I say about the Quran, it's never the final interpretation, because if I believe it's the eternal word of God, there's always much more to be said about the word of God. In fact, as a Muslim, uh, I believe that, and the Quran states that, that only God knows the real meaning of the revelation of the particular verse. So there's always an effort that we try to, you know, come up the best we can to understand uh, the word of God. Um, but scholars always end the commentary saying, only God knows best. I tried my best here to understand it. And this whole new modern thing about you know, there's only one final meaning about uh, the revelation. That's a very fundamentalist and extremist approach that actually is a reaction uh, that we see in the modern period that has came up with Muslim extremists. 
but it's not something that you see in the exegetical tradition where people understand there can be sometimes conflicting and contradicting words. So that's where I come from. I, I believe that my context is important as I approach uh, the text, but uh, it's not the only, uh, not the only approach. Yeah, that's super helpful. I mean, in many ways, because I can hear some of our earlier conversations uh, on the same question. And my guess is that many of our viewers wouldn't have have had that assumption that uh, of the richness of the commentary tradition of right. you know the endlessness of of exegesis of you know there's no final interpretation it's just mm -hmm. it's wonderful um thank you thank you thank you yeah and and um yeah that's a super helpful point too about how uh the the idea that there's only one and can only be one um kind of meaning that people can accept that that's a modernist yeah that's a, you know that's a, a pretty contemporary you know pretty recent uh, uh innovation really um but it seems like it's the most serious or kind of ancient um but but i it's also really helpful to think in terms of a conversation too um right. and that's helpful for for christians to think about too with our with our own tradition um and uh, i mean uh, islam more broadly too seems to be um uh, uh, also a, a tradition based in conversation about ethics and practice too. And so m it might be helpful for us to think a, a bit too, just about Islam in general. Um, what are some things about Islam that Christians tend to misunderstand um, in terms of how it works as a religion? I mean, Christians yeah. oftentimes think Islam is just like Christianity, but a little different. Um, but what are some of the things that might help us um, kind of uh, re you know, rethink you know, what, what Islam is? Yeah, just to build on off uh, what I said earlier, like the, I think one of the wrong assumptions is that Islam or the Quran is a book of law and Muslims are just doers, robots in doing everything uniformly. It's a book of regulations and rules and we're just like obsessed with a very uh, dry, uh, you know, rigid life, uh, which is completely inaccurate. You know, Muslims are very like deep into spirituality and theological thinking. So that's, I think, one assumption is that similar to the maybe Jewish tradition, there is a more emphasis on law. And I've even heard some people in the academy saying, you know, Islam doesn't have a theology. I mean, like, like, I was like, where, where does this come really? from? Like as if, <laughs> as if people, Muslims don't talk about God, they are not interested in the nature oh, wow. of God and the divinity. So that's completely false. Uh, and then of course, again, the, another misconception is that Muslims act the same way. They're, very, they're a very uniform, monolithic community. And Muslims come, I mean, we, we talk about a, a community, 1.6 billion Muslims around the world who come from very different cultural, socioeconomic, linguistic, geographical context. So there is a huge diversity. And to keep that in mind when we talk about Muslims is very important, especially when it comes to Muslims in America, which is a very diverse group. So while they share core tenets and core beliefs, there's also a lot of diversity when it comes to, you know, issues around uh, gender justice and comes to, you know, governmental issues. In fact, the Quran is only 1% focusing on uh, legal issues. The other, the majority, the, the really the majority of the themes focuses on the ethical, the moral life, uh, the belief in the afterlife, ethics, morals, um, you know, the prophetic narratives. So that's, I think, a distortion that is out there. And um, just to really keep that in mind when we talk about Muslims, we are talking about human beings who are very complex, just like uh, me as an individual, and to keep in mind that every Muslim is on their own spiritual journey, has their own uh, evolution when it comes to spirituality, I think is important. And uh, one word that's used often in the American media to kind of scare people and rile people up and so on is Sharia, um, you Muslim, know, which yeah. roughly <laughs> translates to law, I guess. But, you know, but the, I've, I've even heard some people say, well, we're going to stop people from, you know, kind of making Sharia right. law, the law of the United States of America and stuff like that. I mean... Sharia is a conversation, right? It's a conversation about ethics and practice, right? I mean, can you help us clear that up a bit? Thank like you. what? Yeah, I, I think you just yeah, I think you said it already. It's a, this very, very complex uh, notion of uh, of living your life in a way that is pleasing to God. Mm. And so, even for example, the Sharia say, states that a smile is a charity. That's Sharia, you know. So mm. you're smiling to your neighbor, to a stranger is an act of charity. So try to smile as, as much, much as possible, possible right? Yeah. So this yeah. is an act of worship. 
And yeah. so Sharia is so much more than cutting off the hands or like, you know, these kind of very harsh things that we associate the buzzword with Sharia. You know, we want to ban Sharia. You can't ban Sharia because Muslims are already living it. You know, five times prayer, being good to your parents, being good to your neighbor. That's all part of the Sharia. Sharia is like, as we, if we want to compare it as like this, even with the constitution in America, we, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a system that is constantly evolving. We are constantly reinterpreting it in new and fresh and trying to come to live more fully as human beings as we try to come closer to God. And so it's, it's, for example, healthcare. There's nothing in the Quran that talks about healthcare, but there are basic principles and God left it to people to decide based on these principles, how they want to govern their lives, how they want to structure a healthcare system. So there are these very important principles like the sacredness of life and so forth that the Sharia builds on, the revelation and the prophetic example that Muslims then with reason can come up with certain uh, solutions and conclusions. In fact, when you look at the golden age of Islam, you had some of the major scientists being great theologians, like people mm. like Avicenna, you know, Averroes. These people never seen, you know, the sciences as separate from the sacred enterprise. They always knew when I study medicine, when I study physics, astronomy, something about God will be revealed in this very beautiful aspect of science because God's qualities are in every aspect of science. So that kind of endeavor study actually led to a closer relationship to God. It was not something seen as separate. You know, there was no understanding of the sac sacred and the mundane or profane. Um, uh, so the Sharia is really like a very big evolving system where we constantly, when we talk about gun violence, healthcare, uh, all these issues that we look at what has revelation provided and reason is also a God-given gift. And so we can make, we can structure our lives according to that. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and kind of building on that too, with like the, uh, the role of the Quran. Um, so, uh, you know, many Christians just kind of assume that the Quran um, is just kind of like the Bible, pretty much the same thing, just in a different religion or something. Um, right. That sacred scriptures kind of all function the same way. And then there's other Christians who imagine that the Quran is like, I don't know, the you know, the devil incarnate or something, you know, it gets this kind of uh, reputation of like, mm -hmm. it's only about killing people and so on. By the way, there's a lot of violence in the Bible too, right? Old Testament and New Testament, right? Jesus talked Thank about Thank you, you for know, saying like, that. Yes, this is, uh, you know, every religion has to talk about violence. And in fact, um, every religion has metaphors about violence because uh, if, if, if religions at all think about the world as being not what it should be, then there's some sort of struggle involved. And that struggle is going to use metaphors of violence. I mean, every, yeah. every religion does this, even, you know, uh, you know Buddha talks about uh, violence, you know. Um, so all to say that there's um, uh, uh, th there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what the Quran is, what it says. Um, can you help us understand a little bit better what um, uh, how how the Quran functions in in Islam? Yeah, so the Quran is really, as I said, you know, is the primary source of authority, and Muslims really look into the Quran in trying to understand uh, the meaning of human life, the meaning of their own existence. And you're absolutely right, the Quran is misunderstood because oftentimes uh, it's believed that, okay, this text came down as this one corpus uh, and uh, Muslims have just like, you know, it's full of violent texts, uh, violent paragraphs. And again, for anybody, I invite you to like, just take a look into the Quran. And uh, I always invite people to, to approach it as a resident alien. Uh, I think that is a very helpful concept. So you'll see, when you approach the Quran, that you will find narratives that are familiar to you. So you, you'll see, oh, there is, I feel myself like a resident. I, I can see myself, I've heard these names, Adam, Noah. But then also there are things that you find alien because right. the Quran offers its own unique reading of the same narrative, for example. And then it doesn't start with the Genesis story and then ends uh, you know, with the book of Revelation also. No, there's no chronology. The, the Quran is not interested in geography, in, in, in genealogy. So sometimes when we uh, approach the Quran with the biblical framework in mind, we get disappointed. We're like, oh, that's not like I expected. So it's always good to really keep that in mind as we enter the Quran. You are a guest and the Quran is a universal discourse. It's not for Muslims only. So when we talk at, for example, the 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 chapter three that you know that uh, on Mary and Jesus it actually talks to Christians and Jews, so and it talks often to people of no faith. 
So it's not a Quran just for Muslims, but it's really a, a discourse to all humanity and invites everybody comment and, and really like wrestle with me, you know, really ask these critical questions. And in fact, what I said earlier about uh, the scientists, the Quran always invites people to critically ask, investigate, ask healthy questions, analyze, examine. And that actually led to the pursuit of science and so forth. So Quran is not a static text. It was gradually revealed over a period of 23 years. And Muslims have slowly, you know, uh, there's also a pedagogical element to it. They were trying to live slowly into the world of the Quran. So it was not a change overnight, but it was really a, a gradual revelation over a period of 23 years where Muslims, you know, in the first 13 years, it was a deep focus on self-reformation, really understanding who I am in my relationship in God, what's the meaning of this world, and then slowly going into more communal aspects, like what, are my, what is my relationship with especially the Jewish and Christian communities who were present at that time, and then uh, you know, Zoroastrians and people of no faith. So it really like enters into this larger spectrum of human life. So uh, it's really... Uh, the Quran is not, you know, uh, just speaking to Muslims. So that's really important, but it talks to the people of the book. The, and it doesn't see itself as a new revelation. It makes the claim that it has been always uh, a primordial message and that previous revelations like the Hebrew Testament, the Torah and the Gospels are coming from the same source. The Quran makes it claim that it corrects, clarifies, uh, certain issues and sometimes makes also the critical claims things have been altered or changed or misinterpreted. So that's, I think, the unique angle that the Quran uh, uh, wants to tackle also. Super, super helpful. Again, I, we don't want to do sort of general questions all morning, but we could. We know we could with you and we would learn uh, so much from it. But I, we're so grateful, again, for our viewers and for ourselves that to, to sort of clarify some of these basic uh, things as it relates to Islam and the Quran. But now let, let us turn our attention uh, to the question of Mary in the Quran. And I think pr probably, you know, if I stopped somebody on the side of the street today and said, did you know that Mary's in the Quran? They would say, that's <laughs> weird. Like, no, I didn't know I that. Know. And so I wonder if just as a sort of an opening question, you might talk about like the significance of Mary in the Quran sort of in her own right, uh, or, you know, in, you know, before we get into the specific chapters that mention her, just you know, what is the sense of Mary in the Quran and, and why is that important? And, and by the way, I was blown away when I first learned that Mary is in m more prominent in the Quran than she is in the Bible. And there's more about her in the Quran than there is right. in the Bible. I mean, that, sh that should make Christians stop and think for a second. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very excellent point. I think not many people are aware how much, uh, you know, weight the Quran gives to her uh, she is mentioned especially in chapter, you know, Maryam, the chapter of Mary, which is the 14th chapter, and then there's chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 19, and then chapter 3, and then there are other chapters. But the specific chapter that really is dedicated to her, so there are 114 chapters of the Quran called surahs, and an, un, an entire chapter is dedicated to her. So she really, as Chris already pointed out so beautifully, she is a person in her own right. She is she is important by herself, mm. her devotion, her piety, her relationship with God. That's the focus of the Quran. It's not because she is the mother of Jesus, but she, just like with her own persona, you know, her unique personality and her unique faith life is what it really is uh, so heavily focused on. So I think that's number one, which is very important. So Joseph doesn't even appear in the story in, in the Quranic narrative. He's not important. Uh, poor Joseph, <laughs> but she is really, um, she is amazing, you know, because early on her, her, her birth, you know, is a miracle because her mother, <laughs> Hannah, or Saint Anne, she wants to dedicate her child to the temple, the sacred temple, which is, of course, only accessible to a male scholarly elite. And then the Quran talks about when she was born, the astonishment of Mary's mother this is a female, this is a girl. How can I even dedicate her to the temple now? Because only male huh. figures are allowed into the sacred temple, right? 
And then there's this beautiful response in the Quran. God knows that she, she you know, uh, Mary is a female and he wants her to be, he wants somebody, you know, he wants a woman to enter the sacred shrine. So she is challenging male patriarchy. She's challenging the scholarly elite. Uh, God sends her into the sacred temple. So her birth is already miraculous. And, and this beautiful response that God wants a female to enter the holy temple is, is, is just amazing. And also like women tend to be, you know, on the margins of society, even still today where we struggle to have a place. I think for me as a Muslim woman, when I look up to Mary, she is somebody who really speaks uh, to you today because oftentimes even like with my appearance as a Muslim woman, I was denied access to the job market. I was denied to mainstream society because I look different. I'm a woman, I'm a Muslim woman. I don't fit the notion of modernity and democracy or whatever. But then you have Mary pushing these limits, you know, God saying, you know, mm-hmm. if, you, if you really are trustful, if you really, uh, you know, have trust and faith in God, he will open these barriers. He will, mm-hmm. you know, make you overcome these obstacles and challenges. So really she speaks, she is uh, just amazing. And then of course her early life where she is in the temple, completely devoted to God. And then she's experiencing these miracles where God sends these uh, fruits, you know, uh, these uh, fruits of, of the winter, you know, in the summer season that is miraculous. And then Zechariah, prophet Zechariah asked, so how did you receive these fruits? And she just responds, God provides without measure to everyone he wills, right? So what's interesting in this, uh, in, in chapter three, you see this theme of causality challenge. So uh, it appears often, so when I was reading it again, so there's always this, you know, Zechariah is old. And then in that moment, he actually, when he witnesses that she is provided miraculously fruits uh, by God, he prays to God that God should send him, you know, would bless him with a child because he's very old. And then again, this theme of causality, I'm old, how can I have a child? My, my wife, she is, she is, uh, she's old. And so you see this, the theme of causality and then Mary again, challenging, how can I have a son without having a man touch me? So again, you know, we all operate in a, in a world of causality, which is a God given law. But then God reminds us that, you know, I'm the cause of causes. I'm the one who causes causality. Yeah. So don't get caught up in this kind of almost like um, uh, what, you know, associating partners with God and saying causes are, you know, what really rule the world where God, especially in this pandemic, sometimes we feel like causes have exhausted their limits. Mm. It's God who causes the causes. And so, yes, Mary receives the fruits as miracles. Zechariah, you know, is having a child in old age, and then she is having a child miraculously without a man touching her. So there is a very interesting theme, and, and you know, what's happening there is very, it challenges our notions of, of how causality operates in our world. Oh, that's, that's super helpful. So j- again, just, we've we sort of transitioned in, in, into Surah 3, which you mentioned is one of the the major chapters, uh, and we're correct in referring to them, or at least I've seen them referred to as verses, and it's like Surah 3, verses 35 through roughly 46, and mm-hmm. it, um, unlike the New Testament Gospels, which we've talked about in our first week, uh, it, it contains some backstory of Mary, much like we see in early Christian literature that is later, like uh, I think you mentioned in some of your notes, the Protevangelium of James or the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, right. these traditions about uh, about Mary and Jesus that are, um, you know, they're, you know, outside of the New Testament canon and yet are still very, you know, important for developing reflection on Mary. Um and Brennan and I were talking before, um, and and I, I think that this is this is a dicey question. So feel free to punt or or you know answer it. However, but w- we do a lot as biblical scholars talking about tradition history. You know how earlier traditions are being sort of reused and reinterpreted in later traditions. And so you know when I think about the Proto Evangelium of James, I can sort of locate the lines that resemble the Gospel of Luke or resemble the Gospel of Matthew and, and say, oh, look at this really cool use of reinterpretation or whatever. Um, 
and and so when I read the Sura three and I see some references to um, casting lots or or other sort of traditions that remind me of the Proto Evangelium of James, I have the same sort of thinking, but that might be wrong in my attempt to understand how the Quran is engaging these these traditions or not engaging these traditions, and so. Um, you know, again, just just sort of the question of um, how do you or how do Muslim scholars or or any you know any way you want to go about thinking about it um, think about the sort of the interacting of of earlier or later traditions? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. And the Quran itself, you know, as I said earlier, it doesn't go into detail in uh, providing these narratives or uh, uh, re-explaining the narratives. Oftentimes you see the formula, formula and remember, and remember. So it always uh, reminds its audience that things have been said already. So it refers it to, I mean, especially when it comes to Muslims, to really engage them with biblical scholarship. And a lot of Christians who have entered, you know, uh, converted to, you know, Islam in their lives, brought in also their knowledge of the biblical texts. So there has been also a lot of, uh, you know, enrichment in that regard. I think for Muslims, it's always important. And it's, you know, you just pointed out, you come to the Quranic text and you see similarities, differences. That's the resident alien approach that I was talking about. So you see similarities, but there are also these differences. And they have been already alluded to in previous scriptures. So the Quran doesn't spend time to like going and, okay, let me talk about this again. No, it makes the assumption that you are engaging with the biblical revelation, that you're engaging with the biblical scriptures. And in fact, there was always a rich biblical scholarship uh, in the Muslim community, hmm. which unfortunately has slowed down uh, and you know, is being revived again. But again, this is always this push to say, you know, engage with the previous scriptures. And for Muslims, it was important whatever contradicted the Quranic account has to be, you know, uh, you know, we were cautious with that. Uh, but when it confirmed the Quranic account, then that has been always taken as, as truth. Um, so yes, when it comes to the gospel of James, you know, the infancy gospels, you see some of these kind of uh, accounts uh, mirrored in the Quran, but they also like sometimes, uh, at times are different. Uh, so for example, casting the lots or the pens, you see like the slight details. And just to emphasize that I didn't say earlier, Mary is seen completely as fully human. So she has no understanding, even uh, despite her, you know, even with her piety and devotion, she's always seen as fully human uh, in that regard, even with, uh, with the, you know, the miraculous birth of Jesus, uh, who again is seen as fully, fully divine. So I think that I, I, I forgot to mention that earlier. So uh, that's really key. The Quran always pushes the reader to, engage and embrace with previous revelations. And in fact, one article of faith, pillar of Islam is you have to have a belief, have to embrace the belief in previous scriptures. If you, mm -hmm. if you are Muslim and say, you know, I'm fine with the gospels but, or the gospel, but I'm not fine with the Torah, that doesn't work. You have to in, <laughs> embrace the full package. And in fact, the Quran speaks to the, to, um, Makes the makes the claim that God has sent many more messengers and many more revelations to other nations, but only God knows their exact number. So there is a kind of also pluralistic element there, mm. but it still makes an exclusive claim for a final revelation. Yeah, and I, I love that we see, we can see that in Surah three, um, uh, in verse forty eight, uh, where God's response um, to Mary's question, you know, how can this happen? By the way, the the it, it, I think Christians might be surprised to know that um, that Mary has a virgin birth uh, in in Islam, but mm -hmm. also I, I love how you pointed out that it's a causality is a is a is a main theme of of Mary in Islam. I mean, I've, I I kind of love. Uh, uh, the the philosophy of causality in in Islam like I've I've not read terribly deeply but what I've read has been fascinating you know throughout history the kind of conversation about about causes um, and even their contemporary philosophers I know that are that are dealing with this um, kind of 
uh, Western philosophers are kind of reading um, Islamic philosophy and thinking about causality in different ways, which is fascinating. But but this um, this story here that that Mary's virgin birth is a, a, a prompt to think about God as the cause of all things. God says be, and it, and, it, and it is. It happens, right? Um, but then also there's this conversation that follows that uh, that that Jesus is going to be one to teach um, scripture and wisdom and Torah and the gospel, and so it, it explicitly refers to these kind of former uh, former scriptures, right? Which I think also Christians a lot a lot of folks uh, in America don't don't understand understand that Islam doesn't, Islam loves Jesus and says Jesus is great. And like, and, and also uh, the gospels and the Torah are not evil, right? I mean, those, those mm -hmm. are a part, actually a part of the, of the scriptural tradition um, in, in, in a source of, of knowledge and wisdom. But how, how all that ties together actually in Surah 3 is really fascinating. But, um, but the, the um, in, in, in terms of causality, um, to, to kind of bring it back to that for, for a moment, the, uh, what, what practical, uh, implications might that have for, say, uh, contemporary, um, uh, you know, contemporary Muslims who might be reading this passage and thinking about how that causality interacts, that, that, that teaching um, mm -hmm. that Mary is giving us. What, what does that have to do with kind of our daily lives? Um, and does this mean, does Mary mean something in particular for women too in, in, uh, in uh, Muslim tradition? I mean, uh, Mary, for Muslim men and women generally, she is a, a role model. She is an example of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, piety and devotion, and 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 really some someone who has been venerated in the Islamic tradition in such a high manner. She is seen as one of the women who will be have the highest stage in paradise, uh, and she again, I mean this you can always approach the Quran in different ways. When I was reading it, the theme of causality just like came up to me. I was like, oh, this is interesting. There's this challenging yeah. of our notion. And that sometimes becomes, especially in our modern world, causes, you know, this is like such a big thing. And that doesn't mean for Muslims that, okay, if I put my hand into the fire, it will not burn because God will miraculously protect me. No. Uh, it's the idea as we operate in this world with causes that again is, is God wants us to do, that we always keep in mind that he is ultimately the one who has sovereignty, power over the causes, um, that again, if, if he says be, then it can be like the Quran says, you know, so to keep that in mind and not to associate causes, uh, which is the new polytheism in a way, because we like, you know, associate that. Sometimes you get caught up in these causes. And we say, um, and in Islam, it's very important to, um, to be aware that whatever I do, God has the final say, right? God has the power to change course of things. So it's always the both end. What I love about the Quran is never saying either or, you know, either causes or God. No, it's always both end. It's never free will or pre-knowledge of God. It's always both end. We operate with both things. It's never a black-white approach. And I think that speaks to me as a human being, yeah. this dual, dual uh, you know, approach that to really say you have to affirm both. You, you operate in a world of causality. And for many uh, people today in the modern time, they have a hard time believing in miracles. You know, just like Hello, we're talking about an omnipotent God, you know? So uh, yeah. our modern time where we put so much emphasis on reason, which is again, is a God-given gift, uh, we discard everything that doesn't fit into our notion of reason. Because, so it becomes this little God in our heads. Hmm. And, and I think that's the challenge sometimes where we as faithful people in this modern world, yes, we have got to engage reason, we got to engage with causality, but don't forget, don't caught up in that wheel because God is still the, wo the one who sets up the system. And you, you cannot lose sight of that fact, especially in our modern context. A lot of people, again, as I said, they have a hard time believing in miracles in, in these things. Whereas in, in Islam also, it's affirmed, you know, it's a full package. The virgin birth, Muslims, I remember in one class, a professor asked, you know, there were Christians, Muslims in the class, who believes in the virgin birth? Some Christians stood up, some said, you know, how, you know, and then the Muslims were asked, everybody rose up. So you got to, you know, accept the full package of the Quran. Yes, sometimes it's challenging to bring in reason, yeah. um, but uh, miracles don't mean that, uh, you know, I think the ego, our reason can sometimes be an obstacle as we think about our own faith life, right? And so we yeah. have to affirm both.
In my, I mean, as a, as a Christian, the, the one that one of the things I love about the Christmas story is this idea that um, there 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 is always at every moment in in our lives, uh, in every moment in history, there's this opportunity. Uh, for God to emerge in ways that are unexpected, right? Mm. The, the possibility of newness of, of, and coming from unexpected places, unexpected people, and so on, this kind of em- possibility of emergence, right? Some, something can emerge here. And that like our, our yeah, modern notions of science and history and so on, a lot of times we're trying to like kind of explain away everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, yeah. the you know, theologian, uh, the Christian theologian has, uh, you know, said like, you know, the problem with kind of, yeah, science using like, uh, you know, a lot of Christians hate science and, you know, whatever, want to fight against it and reject it. But then there are Christians who, who, who take, take it and try to explain away their own faith with it, um, except for those, these little things that science can't explain or something. And on offer, so that's the God of the gaps. Like you're, you're just reducing God there. Instead, God's the cause of all of this stuff, right? But I love that about Islamic thought that like just the, thinking very carefully about um, that, like, yeah, I mean, that, that, that a lot of the things we ascribe causality to are in fact, are in fact gods. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for getting into that with me. Oh, Chris, again, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Science, is not, science is not a separate endeavor, as I said, you know, like it's really how God reveals himself through science. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. we see God, the healer, through the science of medicine. We see God, uh, you know, the provider through the science of nutrition. So in, in Islamic thought, every science is just another quality of God. And as you study it, mm-hmm. Uh, with your own passion and skills, you're attracted to one certain quality of God and you discover a a little aspect of God that has not been discovered yet. Thank you. I I think scientism is the new challenge in our our society. And I'm not somebody, you know, I'm all in favor of science, but there's always, science also is something that evolves, you know, things that have been said 60 years ago, you know, have been modified. So we need to be also be cautious about that. I love it. Such a, so rich. Uh, the both and is a takeaway for me. Uh, I, I'll use a, a phrase uh, from Barbara Brown Taylor. Uh, you're giving me holy envy, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> as a resident alien in this conversation. Um, we would I'm a be, resident alien myself, legally, so. <laughs> uh, we, would, we would be really uh, remiss if we didn't talk at least a little bit uh, about Surah 19, which is yeah, a, yeah. a surah that is actually named after Mary. It is the whole chapter. Uh, you know, it, it as I've, my, my very uh, sort of uh, novice engagement with the Quran is, these chapters are often much richer and fuller than their like some the paragraph summary introducing them is or even their title they mm-hmm. they there there's an expansiveness to these chapters and so even though surah 19 is called you know mary it it does it talks about other things beyond mary but right. again just help us think about what we learn about mary uh in surah 19 that that maybe is interesting or important or surprising Yes, I think you made an excellent observation that the titles themselves, uh, you, you get the impression, okay, Surah Maryam is only about Mary, but it really like uh, covers uh, a lot of themes again. And so uh, just to, to, to flag that, I think is important. And in Surah Maryam or Surah 19, chapter 19, Surah just means uh, literally wall. So it's something that separates. So it's uh, the, the technical term is chapter. So the chapter really focuses on her adult life, especially her relationship with Jesus and how she then, you know, uh, appears in front of her people. And uh, as a mother of Jesus really challenges, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's a very emotional chapter also because she's really by herself in the desert as she's delivering the child this agony she felt, you know, and it's, of course, uh, adultery is, uh, uh, you know, is, is a scandal in the society, of course, you know, like, even today, you know, when you, when you hear these things, you feel like, you know, this is still uh, in some communities is a, is such a huge challenge, but just like she feels like, oh, I wish I could die, because how am I going to go to my people and explain to them where this child come from? So you really, see uh you know uh, god comforting her and then the angel also uh being sent to her and that's where it gets tricky where muslim theologians have debated whether she's a prophet because she really sees the archangel gabriel in human form she communicates with him and he sends her this like divine announcement 
So that's where we have this very interesting debate uh, whether she is a prophet because only prophets really communicate with the Archangel Gabriel. Huh. And then she uh, is invited to shake the date tree until today, even pregnant mothers and the science confirms that dates are good for you when you're <laughs> pregnant, right? So this beautiful way of comforting her, she's by herself in the desert going through that agony of uh, the birth pain. Uh, and it's just like, I, I love it as just as a parent myself, as a mother who went through pregnancy and all of this, just like how God like acknowledges that, that difficulty, you know, that, that kind of agony you feel in that moment and how he comforts her in this beautiful way. I think it was, it just speaks to God's compassionate, um, you know, quality. And then uh, she is called to go to her people and to also uh, fast. So she, she's not allowed to speak. And in fact, she is um, receiving the divine call to not to speak, to be silent and to point to the child. And then we have the first miracle of Jesus speaking as an infant to the people and, uh, you know, protecting his mother and saying, you know, I will be obedient to her and she is pure and she's like, he is declaring her purity. And so that's, uh, you know, her miracle is also that she points to the child and then the child speaks. There's also this kind of prophetic element there. And just to, um, as a side note, being a prophet, it's the highest rank a human can achieve. So when sometimes when I tell Christian students, you know, prophet is, is, is really high status. And in Islam, it's like somebody who ha is a model to be exemplified. And so she points to the child and the child speaks to people. And then Jesus speaks, uh, peace be upon him. And so miracles all around again here and then the the response of her people uh you know accusing and then there's complete silence they understand and that they bow down and prostrate in front of jesus and uh, accept his prophecy but so it's it's a very moving moving account i think all around and for muslims um again this is one of the miracles they embrace yeah so i loved i loved uh thank you for that amazing summary by the way um yeah i i one of the one of the things that i think that some of our our viewers would notice if they if they took the time to read surah 19 is it gives us a far more rounded account of what's going on inside of mary than mm -hmm. certainly what we see in the new testament gospels and even more than we see in some of the non-canonical later literature that that she's in agony that she's you know out in the desert by herself that she refuses to speak she's that she's afraid you know even uh, of her, of her, of reporting what god has done for her and it, again um this is the the sort of stuff that we we often use a sanctified imagination as christian teachers and preachers but like the quran like rounds it out for us uh which mm -hmm. i think is beautiful and I also couldn't help but think about the the story of Hagar in the wilderness, Brennan, in chapter 19, that, that you know, in a similar way that, that Hagar is provided for um, in fear of her, you know, uh, her, 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 her mistress, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that the, the wilderness becomes this place of provision for uh, a woman and a child. And uh, it just, there were, there was something about the desert and the, and the dates uh, that just reminded me of that Hagar story. It just was, yeah. it was a beautiful sort of account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, now that you're speaking of it, Chris, I, I think Hagar and Mary, I oftentimes, I think what I love about the Quran is uh, really lifting up those who sometimes we perceive at the margins and really like putting them at the center. I think as if God, you know, calls us to pay attention who are the people who are silenced? Bring them to the center, give them a voice, uh, hear them, listen to them. Uh, oftentimes it's, you know, every, uh, you know, Hagar, Mother Hajar, as she's called in Islam, she is again an example of, of piety and devotion. And uh, she speaks to us now. She, you know, she represents the woman who has been abandoned by her husband, who is as the single mom who's trying to raise and save her child. She is, mm. you know, the refugee in the desert who's trying to survive with her child. She represents a domestic worker who has been abused, who is still abused today. You know, all these labor workers, domestic uh, labor workers around the world. So, you know, really paying attention to these uh, holy individuals that are marginalized even today in society and really bringing them into the center of our lives and paying attention. And, 
and and God telling me, you know, listen carefully, you know, to those people you always perceive at the margins. And here we have Mary again in the desert, and every woman knows the agony of the birth pain, you know, how terrible it is. And it's powerful to just like bring it into this universal revelation and say, this is important, you know, this difficulty to acknowledge and everybody should, should uh, really lift up that experience and, and pay attention to what these women have to say. Uh, and, and they guide us in our understanding of human life. And so, uh, again, the Quran is not just a historical document, you know, uh, revealed in seventh century, but it still has application for human life today. And as somebody who comes to the Quran, you know, listening, uh, hearing the story of Hagar, uh, Mary, uh, these women, and Mary is the only one who is mentioned by name in the Quran, but sometimes the Quran, you know, mentions other women. And I, I wondered why is, it, why is it not mentioning their names? Because it could be anybody, you know, it could be, it speaks to, to the universal experience. So yeah. that unnaming often also means what's important here is that, you know, mm. a shared human experience, not just, okay, this is the experience of this particular woman. No, it's really a universal experience. Interesting. And thinking about that universal experience in Surah 19, in verse 23, Mary um, expresses grief and, you know, uh, frustration and, and even, uh, you know, expresses, uh, you know, mm -hmm. thoughts of death, right? I mean, the, and this, yeah. this um, you know, might be shocking to some people who expect kind of a very, um, you know, straight laced, you know, just I love you, God, no matter what, you know, like I accept this no matter what, um, but that she is. And so some of that kind of the, the, the uh, shared human experience of like admitting that, that, that yeah. we grieve, that we have these feelings, but also, you know, kind of saying them out loud in some, in some ways, expressing who we are, gives God an opportunity to respond, which God does here, right, to Mary. I mean, yeah. do we see that uh, commonly throughout the Quran, um, the, the kind of expression of grief or, or suffering, and, and, and how, how might we learn from the Quran of how to express our grief and what to do with it? Yeah, that's a wonderful observation. Mm -hmm. I think I'm always, what I see in the Quran in my limited experience is really to embrace our full humanity. And then when you look at these prophetic narratives, there's always faithful trust and surrender in God, but there's also sadness and grief mm -hmm. and suffering and persecution and exile. So we hold all these, we bring our, the invitation to bring our full selves, human selves to, to God and not to deny these human emotions and experiences because in every emotion, there's always a way to connect to God with again the both end approach it's not okay i'm a holy person i'm devout and pious i can't grieve i can't be hopeless i can't fall into despair no there's no such thing in fact when we you know listen to the story of prophet jacob how he became blind because of all the crying for his son joseph and but he still in his heart was this content with the decree of god so it's this contentment in your heart Whatever happens in your life, still God is, um, uh, you know, in charge and is, uh, you know, caring for you in this most compassionate and merciful way. But then you're also shedding tears. You are just a human being. And with that humanity, I think God calls us to bring our full humanity and not to deny our human emotions. I'm a big advocate as a parent that my children experience and witness my human emotions mm. and not this kind of, oh, I'm going to be the smiley, positive parent all around. I want them to learn to, to, to see me as a full human being and how I wrestle and work through my own human world and emotions and feelings and to guide them and how they should, uh, you know, uh, work through their anger and hopelessness and, you know, sadness. I think that's key here. And, and I see it modeled through the prophets, through, through Mary, in her agony to say, I wish I could die here, you know, like this is uh, because herself is nurtured through community. Oftentimes in our Western uh, in the understanding of individualism, we think our self is just nurtured by our own being. But in a lot of communities, when you are separated from your community, your self suffers. So you are nourished by the community, your self worth, your self is sustained by being a member of the community. So it's easy for us to say, well, who cares what others think? Mm -hmm. But if you're like accused of adultery, uh, if you, 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 you cease to exist, you know, in some tribes, if you're not, it's, it's a matter of survival. If you're not part of the community, you die. 
right? Literally, like uh, your honor is gone, you are gone, right? So for Mary, the question is really, I'm not going to survive. I wish I would die because if I'm accused of dishonor, then it's like it's worse than that, right? So, so to, just to keep that in mind, and in some in, in some communities, still this kind of uh, understanding that the self is sustained through the community is still very much important. So yes, God is beautifully bringing back her words into the revelation and wants people to remember it's okay to feel that way. It's okay to, we all as human beings feel down and feel hopeless at times, but it's still in this darkness where we can also experience God's, uh, you know, qualities and the relationship. Uh, you mentioned uh, Barbara Brown Taylor. She talked about solar spirituality. Like we always think if it, you know, sunshine in our life, that's the only way we can connect to God. No, it's oftentimes in the most darkest moments in the challenges and the hardship that we built the most intimate connection with God. And um, I, I, I witnessed that in my own life. I'm sure many people can relate to that as well. So that's, I think, the key point in the both end, in the, in the dark and the solar, we experience God with, with all our emotions. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's so Such rich. Such a great takeaway. Um, yeah. well, we, we actually, uh, can, I, can I, we have a question yeah. Yeah, that yeah. somebody uh, raised on Facebook, if I can um, just ask this. I mean, so this person is asking about um, about mystical traditions in, in Islam and asks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are there um, like apparitions or, you know, visions? I mean, in, in Christian tradition, this is a very common thing, um, you know, less common in, in uh, reformed circles and so on. But um, but throughout Christian tradition, people have had apparition sites, sightings, uh, you know, mystical interactions with Mary. Has, has this um, has this been a part of Islam uh, at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mary has been definitely uh, seen and uh, venerated as a, a, a figure of devotion. And uh, it's beautiful, you know, like different Sufi saints and Sufi orders, which is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Islamic mysticism uh, branch in Islam. It's, it's not a heterodox idea, you know, like it's really mainstream, really trying to bring in the both ends, like really focusing on the heart aspect, but also the reason and the practice. Because there was a time in Islamic history where people, be, you know, got too obsessed with rituals and rigidity and rules. And the Sufis were like, hey, the heart dimension is important, you know, it's really the core of our being is the heart. So, uh, it, in, in the Sufi tradition or the Islamic mystical branch, Mary has uh, definitely a high position, just like in mainstream Islam, uh, because, you know, her practice of being in the mihrab, in the, ch in the, in the so sacred ch chamber in her temple, being, uh, you know, uh, being occupied with remembrance and supplication of God and certain prayers, that has been seen as an example. And there's even a, a branch called the Mariamiya. I'm... I I uh, I read about it, but I don't know the exact details. But she's definitely seen as a person of veneration in the Islamic Sufi tradition. In the past six seven years, we have taken Christians and Muslims to the House of Mary in Ephesus. I don't know if some of your viewers are familiar, but it's yeah. a place of veneration for Muslims and Christians. It's mm. beautiful yeah. uh, because and then it has been sanctified also by the Catholic Church. Acknowledged, I think, Leo the Thirteenth was the first pope to visit. Uh, but it's a it's a beautiful site where a lot of people come and spend time in prayer. It's believed to be a place where she, where she spent her last years of her life. So we do these visits, and mm -hmm. she is really the, a, a bridge, not just uh, not just a, an example of devotion uh, mm -hmm. in the Muslim or Christian tradition, but people from all over the world. So her mm -hmm. spiritual legacy still continues. And maybe we can use that as a segue to um, to something that's of crucial interest to you and in part and, and, and part of your work, um, which is interfaith dialogue. And so, Mary, we've already just seen with that example of, of Ephesus uh, of Mary's house that, that that she's functioning as a bridge um, to 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 help people see that there are shared elements of their of their mm -hmm. faith traditions that overlap and that are of mutual concern and, and interest. Um, but in, in in what other ways or how how more broadly can Mary um, uh, function in interfaith dialogue between Christians uh, and, and Muslims. Yeah, I think how beautiful, again, legacy is that she really still brings us together. I mean, in the, 
Catholic tradition where she, she's seen as the mother of God, more, you know, the high veneration. They get sometimes disappointed that Muslims don't elevate her to a higher rank, but she still built bridges between uh, Muslims and Christians when they enter into dialogues. And here, I think it's important when we uh, engage interreligiously. Yes, we want to be polite in the beginning and focus on the commonalities, but also to highlight the differences and embrace them. There's a reason why I'm a Muslim. There's a reason why you are a Christian. Uh, because every tradition has something to, unique to offer and to embrace that and not to, you know, come this, uh, with this kind of wishy-washy approach and, and claim that we're all the same. We are to some degree, but we're also not. And I think the, the, she, um, as a figure, she brings us together in really trying to, what we just talked about, what are some of the ways that we are different? Where do you think she, you have that narrative about her? I have that about her and bringing it together, we get a fuller picture about her. And so we still, we will continue to wrestle with that. Uh, we don't need to reconcile on all of this. And ultimately, as the Quran says, God will, you know, uh, reveal where we differed and he will make the ultimate judgment and all of that. So I think we are at the Institute, we are really passionate about bringing together people of uh, all backgrounds, but to really embrace the difference uh, and not to, to just uh, you know, disregard them because they're really important in, in our faith identities. Yeah. And I just, Zeno, I just posted in the, the Facebook chat uh, a link to the website for the Institute for Islamic, Christian, and Jewish Studies. Um, but maybe in our mm -hmm. last minute, if you would just sort of remind us or, or give a plug for that organization and the work that you're doing uh, there and, you know, anything else that you want to say about that, that, that place that you are now spending so much of your time at. Yeah, thank you. So I came recently on board. I'm really excited to, to begin my work here at the Institute for Islamic Christian and Jewish Studies here in Baltimore. And we are really, again, as I said earlier, about to, we believe that religious difference is a powerful force for good, that uh, religious difference uh, is part of this uh, fabric of society and that it uh, it's an enrichment it's uh, it makes us stronger uh, as as a community and not to uh, neglect those differences so we bring for example uh, a colleague of mine our program director we just started the teachers fellowship network where we bring in teachers from secondary school system to talk about religion in their classrooms whether they are history teachers or social studies teachers to equip uh, students, the next generation, with the necessary religious uh, literacy skills, cultural literacy skills, so we can really be in the world together and, uh, and communicate and collaborate. So it's really important because religion still informs our uh, being. And uh, so not to know about religious communities, we cannot afford that. So we are trying to educate the educators, that's one thing. And then we have a lot of civic leaders, clergy people, that we do uh, work together with. Uh, one thing, of course, I'm the Muslim scholar here, so I'm passionate about building networks with Muslim communities so we can create these alliances where interreligious spaces uh, are more present so people can actually talk about what we just did here. Hey, let's, let's talk about this, right? Where are we different? Where are we similar? And then, of course, everywhere where religious pluralism is already present, you know, healthcare system, uh, libraries, wherever we naturally gather, but we don't necessarily talk about our religion. And because we don't talk, there's also a lot of ignorance and hostility. And there's important social scientific research that shows it's through relationships that uh, biases are decreased and, uh, you know, discrimination numbers go down. So it's really that we're trying to build long lasting relationships, sustained dialogue networks where we have these wonderful platforms like here where we talk about religion and go away. We don't have to you know, convert each other. Uh, we don't have to like force upon each other each face, but just like make it an uh, intrinsic, you know, make it a, an organic part of our lifestyle and not to be afraid of talking about it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, uh, Hopefully, this is the beginning of uh, some other conversations uh, for our viewers and uh, and for us. But uh, what a what a wonderfully rich um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, session we've had with you. Thank you so much for uh, the insight about not only about the Quran and Islam, but about human experience and about the nature of God. It has been so rich, uh, and we are so grateful for this. Uh, it has been truly a gift to to Brendan and I and to our viewers. So thank you. I so think much. I thank you both. I mean, thank you for this great initiative and the series. I think it's been it's been such a rich conversation, and I just can't thank you enough for for starting this dialogue and conversation and looking forward to continue it at some point. Right. Yes. Well, yeah, we're, we're we are so grateful day. for the gift of your time. Uh, we know that, you know, at the kind of end of the calendar year, it's often a time where things are, uh, you know, everything is, is intense. Um, and we are just <laughs> grateful uh, for the gift of your time, uh, especially during Thank this time you. of year. But, um, but yeah, I, I learned so much. And I, I mean, this, this it makes me want to learn a lot more. So that's always, um, uh, always welcome. Uh, so thank you again so much. And uh, Chris, what, what are we doing next week? If we so can next week, uh, Zainab, you can, you should feel welcome to watch uh, one of my other <laughs> Louisville postdocs doctoral fellow friends, uh, Jennifer Oz Freeman is going to be joining us. She is an She's Orthodox welcome. Christian who teaches art history and theology and um, at uh, the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. And so she's going to be talking to us about Mary in Orthodox Christianity and a little bit more about Mary in Christian art. So, um, and, it, you know, just keeping the Louisville connection going uh, for a second week, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, thank you. That sounds awesome. I'll definitely uh, tune in. All right. All right, y'all. Well, thanks, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful Peace. Christmas. Bye. Peace.